Hi again, Gary Zacharias with the Apologist Bookshelf. I've got a scientific book for you this time. Uh, the author is Fazale or Fuzz Rana, R A N A, Fuzz Rana, and uh, he's part of Reasons to Believe, which is a uh, science and Christian organization combining science and Christianity. And uh, he, he works with Hugh Ross there, and he and Hugh have written several books together, and he's written other books with other individuals. He's got background in uh, biology and chemistry, and so he's a really sharp guy. Um, the book is called The Cell's Design. It uh, came out in 2008, so it's a little bit older, but the information inside is just amazing. I mean, look at the title, The Cell's Design. You know, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, people thought the cell was just a simple bag of protoplasm with a dark nucleus in the middle and that there's not much happening there. And, of course, now contemporary science is learning about what's going on inside the cell. They can probe so deeply into it. And, actually, there's some really wonderful uh, computer-aided uh, uh, works that show what's going on inside the cell that actually make your mouth drop as far as seeing uh, the kinds of things, transportation and the way RNA and DNA works and just all this stuff is just uh, fascinating. So this actually looks at the scientific and theological impact of some of the discoveries that they've been finding as they've probed inside the cell. And, the, of course, the overall big picture is natural processes can't do this. And so uh, Fuzz makes a positive case for life being a supernatural origin. And he highlights all the biochemical features that are going on inside the cell. Uh, it's just astounding. And there have been a lot of people that have commented positively on the book. I would just say this. If you're not a huge fan of uh, science, you might give it a pass and just look for summaries here because it does get into some details. But what I did, since I didn't understand a lot of it, I would just hit the highlights along the way and look at his illustrations and kind of catch the big picture. So it shows you that he really knows what he's talking about. He's uh, backed this up with all sorts of uh, evidence and uh, good footnoting and things like that. I thought I'd look at chapter four. He calls it such a clean machine. And he starts talking about automobiles and automobile engines and all. And he said uh, so many motors and machines going on under the hood of an automobile but he said they're inside a cell too and so i'd like to look at this chapter with you and just talk about a few of the motors that are going on he goes into many more uh, examples but i'm just going to keep it pretty short and he says these biomolecular motors are look a lot like humanly designed engines except one huge difference they're way superior to man-made counterparts amazing and so he says this actually updates the famous watchmaker argument that was popular, uh, popularized in the 18th century by William Paley, who was a British theologian. And Paley said, if you come across a watch, you know immediately this thing was man-made. Natural processes couldn't do this. And so I just wanted to focus on a couple of, uh, he calls a subsection of this chapter, a gallery of molecular motors. And he's got uh, probably half a dozen or so. But I'm just going to hit a couple of them. One is the, the famous one that has been done uh, more than once. Uh, Behe, Michael Behe, talked about it in uh, his book, Darwin's Black Box. And it's about the black bacterial flagellum. And uh, Fuzz says this has become the poster child for intelligent design. It looks like a whip, basically, and it extends outside of a bacterial cell surface. And uh, he said some... So bacteria just have one of those, and others have several. And when they spin around, they can uh, the cell then can zoom around the environment that he's in. And I didn't realize that he points out that there are over 40 different kinds of proteins that make up the typical bacterial flagellum. So we're not talking about one kind of uh, protein that just managed to, by fluke, to get here and, and start doing its thing. I mean, it took a lot. And he says, if you look at the components of this flagellum, it has to go on, on inside the cell and then out through the cell's surface and then create this whip out there. So inside, it's got a, a stator and a rotor and a drive shaft. And it's got a bushing as it uh, goes out of the cell membrane. It's got a universal joint and then a propeller. So it, it's amazing. It looks like a man-made motor. Um, he says, essentially, it's just a molecular-sized electric motor. 
And so he's got an illustration of it. So I'm going to leave that one alone. Then And uh, there's another one here. I'm just, like I said, I'm just going to do a few of them. He says, just recently, a couple of teams of biochemists undercovered another kind of rotary motor that functions as a pump. It pushes fluids. And uh, so I won't even go into all the details of how all these things work. But he says, if you take that bacterial flagellum as an example, he said something that's really interesting about it is you have to do each step as those proteins come together. You can't just have 40 proteins just kind of fall into each other's arms and, and create this uh, amazing whip. It says each step seems to have been planned with subsequent steps in mind. So first, you have uh, the proteins are turned off. In other words, they do not continue to try to make a whip or the bacterial flagellum. They don't do that until the bacterial cell somehow senses that it's the time to produce the flagella. So when that happens, then two proteins get built. And then in the next step, more proteins are built. They, they come on line one at a time. So at first, it's the innermost structure of the flagellum. That'd be the rotor and the stator, and then the drive shaft and the bushings. And once you get all of that, then the third uh, level of, uh, of creation happens when you get the universal joint and the whip-like flagellum. So it says it's a well-orchestrated process, really, that these proteins are present at the proper time. They don't just all happen at once. So I think that's interesting. I didn't know that. Uh, okay, so he talks about a few more motors and all, and he's got a lot of good illustrations to let you see what's going on there. One that I wanted to focus on, it's an amazing molecular motor. It's called Dynan, D-Y-N-E-I-N. If you have a chance, just go online, do a Google search, Dynan, and see if you can find a computerized uh, illustration of the movement of the this Dynan. It looks like almost like a little robot that rides across microtubules inside a cell. And these microtubules form and then fall apart and then form again, and they act as little highways. And Dynan uh, is a big electric motor, and it moves cargo through the cell along these microtubule tracks. And so Dynan carries on its back, in a sense, a piece of cargo, whatever it happens to be, and walks. It walks it along this microtubule to its destination. And it literally looks like walking. You'll see it uh, if you have a chance to take a look at that sometime. Pretty incredible. And then they've discovered something else with, with Dynan, that the distance that Dynan moves varies with the size of the cargo. So in other words, the motor shifts gears in response to its load. Sounds like a car again, doesn't it? Okay, so basically, he says, when he gets finished talking about all these different motors and all, he says, experience teaches that machines and motors don't just happen. Yeah, no kidding. Even the simplest require thoughtful design and manufacture. And so that's back to the watchmaker argument by Paley again. And so the watchmaker analogy basically is super, super simple. Watches display design, so they are the product of a designer, a watchmaker. Well, now we can say organisms display design. Therefore, organisms are the product of a creator. Well, that watchmaker argument didn't fare very well since it was uh, done in the 1700s. I mean, like David Hume went after it, and they said that, well, you're really comparing two different things, organisms and watches. They're, they're way too dissimilar to make an analogy. Now, other people argue that organisms aren't machines, and if you see them as such, you're taking the analogy too far. So, this whole watchmaker argument rests on a particular question. Do living systems resemble man-made machines enough to warrant the analogy? And the follow-up question, if so, how strong is the analogy? Can you make a reasonable conclusion from this? And so, he says that the discovery of all these motors and machines inside the cell on a molecular level really does give new life to that watchmaker argument. Bio-machines that are found in all of us, inside our cells' interiors, show a diversity of form and function, just like the diversity of designs that you see when human engineers build things. And in fact, researchers are now going like crazy developing nano devices on the small scale, and they're finally able to create 
their own nano machines somewhat. They're not very good. Uh, they're motors, and uh, they work kind of. And it said uh, the contrast though between these synthetic molecular motors designed by some of the most brilliant people in the world, and you compare that to the elegance and complexity of molecular motors. He said it's striking. He said the scientists are working like crazy, but they haven't gotten anywhere close to the motors and machines that are going on inside of our cells. So interesting stuff. Uh, let me take the. Let me here we go. Let's take that a little bit further. Uh, they discovered some new uh, biochemical machines. Say it, it adds to the number of different machines that are analogs to man-made devices. And it's, they're satisfying the watchmaker prediction that uh, we saw before. So let's do this. Let's summarize because I didn't want this to get too, too picky and, and too detailed. But this chapter that I've been going through just elaborates some of the details of what's going on on the molecular level, the complexity and the organization I mean, you can see there are molecular level machines inside the cell. And that machinery logically gives you an idea that life's chemistry comes from intelligent design. There's an incredible resemblance between these little motors and what we design as humans, both in form and function. And so Paley's watchmaker argument is back, and it's uh, stronger than ever. The molecular motors are irreducibly complex. And I don't know if we've talked about that yet, but... <clears throat> the idea is that you can't take away one piece of any of these motors and have them still work effectively. So they all have to come together at one time. So gradual evolution designs won't, won't happen. It will not create something like this. Now, Behe uses an example of a, uh, um, a mouse trap. He says, if you just have that little plank of wood and a spring, if they evolve first, you can't catch any mice, so that's totally pointless. If at first uh, the spring evolves and that little piece where you put the cheese, that little uh, triggering device, that won't catch any mice. Well, what if you had um, a staple to hold the whole thing down? Well, that won't catch any mice. You have to have all of the pieces. They're irreducibly complex. Every single one is important. Every single one has to be there or you don't catch any mice. So it's a pointless invention if it's evolution. And he says, work done in the area of nanoscience and nanotechnology just highlights more and more the machine-like character of these biomotors. And he says it shows the elegance of their design. They're doing way better than humans. The cell's machinery is vastly superior, he says, to anything that human designers can accomplish. He gives you an example. Bacterial flagella operate near 100% efficiency. Well, how are we doing as uh, we make our electric motors and all? Well, our electric motors are 65% uh, efficient, and the best combustion engines are about 30%. So run those two numbers by 30%, combustion engines, 65% electric motors. And what about the bacterial flagella? Nearly 100%. Wow. So his summary or his wrap-up at the end of the chapter, he says, is it really reasonable to conclude that these motors are the products of blind, undirected, see, that's the key, undirected physical and chemical processes. How is that possible when they're doing so much better than anything the human mind can achieve? And so he says the elegance and beauty of the cell's machinery cannot be overlooked when you're making a case for intelligent design. And so I think this is a really terrific answer to people who uh, challenge Christianity and Christian and the uh, Judeo-Christian idea of a God and a designer because there's design. It's just screaming design. So this is, uh, one more time, this is a book called The Cell's Design and uh, powerful information there. Now, Kenneth Boas says it makes a significant contribution to the growing scientific literature pointing to intelligent design. And uh, so I think you might enjoy it. Again, it, it's a little heavy going in spots and it depends. If you love that kind of material, fine. I I got a little lost on it, but the parts that I just read to you let, let you know, and that was just one chapter, let you know there's a lot of good material here without having to get into the extreme details, the scientific details. Uh, so if any of Fuzz Rana's books are uh, worth reading, interesting material. All right, well, thanks for uh, joining me for this podcast. Hope to see you again.